Welcome back everyone. Today we're going to focus on two semiconductor companies that we've recently added to our portfolio, Microchip and Lata Semiconductors. This is, these are interesting ones. We decided to do a side-by-side -side comparison of these, uh, not because they're direct competitors, but we think there are some interesting dynamics going on working in both of these companies favor. So Microchip is an IDM, an integrated device manufacturer. They design their chips for their customers and they also manufacture, uh, not all of them in-house, but, but a majority of them in-house. And then Lata Semi uh, is, of course, the last FPGA pure play left standing. Uh, they are, not an IDM. They do they do not do any manufacturing. They outsource all of that, but they handle all of the design. So they are a fabless chip designer. But you pointed this out and got interested in this point about Lattice. We'll discuss this, but there's actually some EDA software business mixed in there at Lattice, which is intriguing to say the least. Before continuing, let me remind you to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel if this video is helpful as you do your own investment research and increase your knowledge of business and technology. We really appreciate the support as subscribing to the channel helps us continue putting out content like this. Yes, it is. And going through the earnings calls of both of these companies paints an even bigger picture, a more interesting picture in what both of these companies do, especially Lattice Semiconductor, in my opinion. So let's just talk about the numbers for the most recent quarter for Microchip. We'll start off with that. So revenue for Microchip, $2.2 which was a 22% year-over-year growth, which is amazing. Gross margin of nearly 68%. Free cash flow was 1.1 billion. Year over year growth of that was 44%. As far as the balance sheet goes, the company has 234 million in cash and short term investments and 6.4 billion in current debt, which we'll talk about that a little bit more coming up. What do you think of some of these numbers that we've discussed? Yeah, this was this was an incredibly impressive quarter, especially given microchip continues to grow against this backdrop of not just a slowing economy, but even some of its peers in the industrial and automotive space have reported kind of flattish at best year over year revenue. Uh, microchip, 41% of their business is industrial, 17% automotive, big growth markets hitting, hitting new uh, secular growth trends here for the next decade, somehow able to go out and, and meet meet the demand. Uh, they've, they've been able to increase their internal manufacturing and then also they do utilize some, some third-party manufacturing as well. They've been able to go out and somehow find someone to supply that big backlog of business that they have. And this is a very similar theme here with microchip. The same thing really with microchip and lattice semiconductor, not just revenue growth, but profit margin expansion over the last few years. So you mentioned the debt, uh, microchip acquired, made a very large acquisition of micro semi back in 2018, took on a lot of debt to do that. Uh, but the merits of doing it are, 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 are being displayed right now. This is a company that looks more and more like the Texas instruments of the microcontroller market with gross margins of 68%, operating margin approaching 40%, tons of free cash flow generation uh, and the ability to kind of adjust their spending from quarter to quarter, depending on what the economy gives them to make sure that they continue generating those high profit margins. Uh, super impressive quarter from Microchip. Yes, absolutely. I found one thing interesting from CEO Ganesh Murthy. He mentioned that they're changing the, the the nomenclature, he said, of the microcontrollers to be mixed signal mic microcontrollers because they have so much analog and mixed signal con content on these integrated chip on chips. So he he mentioned that according to Gartner, microchip is ranked th number three 
in in this space. And they're just 1.4% away from number one. And he said, to put this in perspective, three years ago in 2019, they were 16.5% away from number one. So they're obviously a very fast growing company and closing in on that number one spot in this specific space. And you can see these uh, in this slide about the um, their revenue mix, mix signal MCUs make up 58% of it, of their revenue mix. Yeah, maybe this is a good time to reference the last video we did on microchip, where we explained briefly what a microcontroller is. But you can think of a micro microcontroller almost as a, a small mini computer all integrated on a chip. So you have you have an actual processor that like handles and executes uh, a, a set of instructions, software, basically. You're going to have memory. You're going to have inputs and outputs so that it integrates with the rest of the computing system, like maybe um, a display, uh, for example, and then maybe inputs, like maybe a button on a, a piece of machinery or a piece of equipment, just as a, a very crude example. But they're changing this to mixed signal because the microchip really touts the fact that it is this whole system designer. They don't design just the microcontroller. They also de design all of these other ancillary pieces of the computing system for their customers, which by the way, this is important because most of their customers are non-tech businesses. They don't know how to do this stuff. And so they might turn to microchip and say, hey, we need microcontrollers, but we don't know what to do with the microcontroller. <laughs> And so microchip designs the whole system for them, including the software instructions that will run the equipment. Um, and that's what has really enabled them to kind of leapfrog uh, a couple of companies as they work their ways up the ranks of top microcontroller company in the world. So I, I think at this point, they probably leapfrogged ST Micro for that number three position, which means they're just, like you said, Casey, just a percent. 2% of market share away from uh, NXP and Renaissance. So NXP Semi, of course, the Dutch company, another big automotive play, and Renaissance, the Japanese uh, industrialist. Very impressive performance here for Microchip since that acquisition of, of uh, back in 2018. Nick, I noticed on the earnings call, a number of the analysts were asking about the PSP or preferred supply program at Microchip. And the, the one of the executives had some really interesting points to say. Can you tell us a little bit more about that program and what that means exactly for Microchip? Uh, yes. So maybe for a little bit of background on how the semiconductor industry historically has worked, uh, we will put a link to our What Caused the Chip Shortage video from early on in this channel, actually, uh, that explains historically how the chip industry tended to be left holding the bag, got left holding the bag whenever there was an economic downturn. The trend in recent years has been moving more to long-term sales agreements. Uh, basically, semiconductor businesses uh, when when the chip shortage started in twenty late twenty twenty, uh, a lot of chip suppliers like Microchip kind of told their customers, "Look, uh, if you want guaranteed supply, you need to sign long term agreements with us, so that we're not left holding all of this excess inventory that we have to take a loss on later on." So that the industry has been moving more and more towards that. Uh, I talked to On Semi CFO Thad Trent about that. On Semi has done it. Microchip has done it. This PSP is in reference to that. They will still work with customers in a downturn where the orders will be non-cancelable, but they might have some wiggle room as to delivery to help. They understand that the customers, you know, things happen. Maybe they'll push back the order by a couple of quarters to help them manage their own profit margins. But ultimately, Microchip is saying, as long as as well as the rest of the industry, look, we can't continue the way things were prior to the pandemic. Uh, Texas Instruments has mentioned this. They do not do these long-term sales agreements. They're plenty happy just holding the excess inventory on their books 
One of the reasons they can do that is they focus their efforts on chips that have low obsolescence. Basically, they can hold these things in inventory for a long time because the chips that they design and manufacture kind of never become obsolete because it's already so old. <laughs> um, microchip, a very different, a very different story, but this is a, a healthy development for the semiconductor industry because ultimately someone has to design and manufacture more advanced chips. And it's unfair for that company to have to, you know, eat, eat, foot the bill whenever there's some economic headwinds. So that's what that PSP is at, at, at microchip. It's kind of like when you call up your local pizza place and you place an order, but then never pick it up, right? Like the, you can't do that. Someone is reviewing these orders. It's not just one person calling them up and saying, I'm going to need, you know, a hundred microcontrollers this the next quarter or whatever. It's, it's a multi, multi-level review before the company places the order and before microchip agrees to, to supply it. <laughs> I, I like your illustration. That's perfect. Like, uh, unless you have a great relationship with your local pizzeria, most pizza shops require you to make payment before they're going to start making the pizza. That's exactly the same thing. You're correct. Except chips are like way more capital intensive than making a pizza. So I, this is very fair. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about uh, capital here, capital expenditures and what is to be expected going forward for microchip uh, their outlook, I'll just read over some of the numbers for their outlook, and then we can talk about uh, their their CapEx and, and their plans So going forward. So they expect for, for next quarter the revenue to be between $2.25 billion and $2.32 billion, which would be a 16.5% growth year over year at the midpoint. And during their er earnings call, the CFO mentioned the capital expenditures – are expected to be between 300 and 400 million in fiscal year 2024. So I mentioned microchips ability to sort of adjust their expenses so that they can maintain high profitability, even in a downturn. Uh, it looks like a downturn, at least this downturn anyways, for microchip means 16 and a half percent year over year revenue growth for the quarter that will end in June. Uh, not bad. Not bad, microchip, touche rest of the IDM industry. Basically, what they're saying here, though, with adjusting some of their, their operating expenses downward, also adjusting some of their capital expenditures downward for this next fiscal year. Uh, again, we're now in fiscal year 2024 for microchip. Their fiscal year ends in March. Um, it, it looks like they're expecting some sort of slowdown at some point in 2024. Maybe maybe that dips down to 10%, maybe it dips below 10% year over year growth. That's sort of their long-term financial model through 2026 is 10 to 15% average revenue growth. So maybe we kind of dip below that average at some point this year. Basically what they're saying is they can continue to sustain very high profit margins which should keep earnings per share on the up and up going, heading, heading higher, uh, this year because of that backlog, they have that huge backlog of orders. They're basically saying, we're going to push back some, some expenses until maybe 2025 and work with what we, what we need to continue supplying to our customers before we take on any more orders. So the outlook was fantastic. Uh, and it looks like this company's, um, profitability will continue to, creep higher for the next year. So I pulled a chart from our friends at Main Street Data here of buybacks and dividends over the past few years. What can you tell us about the buyback program here at Microchip? Yeah, as you can see from the chart here, of course, the cash dividend, uh, not bad. It continues to steadily rise. Uh, and the company has this long-term goal of, of ramping up their return of excess cash to shareholders. So the dividend goes up, looks like it's going to keep going up slightly each year, and then they make up the difference with share buybacks. This is this is a, a wonderful tailwind for this this company uh, because basically they're still finishing up the integration with Micro Semi from 2018. 
they're now hitting those long-term growth targets that they that they made five years ago at the time they made that acquisition. And so now we're in this period where they're saying, hey, we've reduced our debt down to our long-term targets. Now we're going to start focusing more on returning cash versus paying off debt. So these these share buybacks should continue to increase over the next three to five years. Price for this stock is between seventy three and seventy four dollars. Is this a fair value? We think so. Uh, we we certainly think so. Uh, I think the last video we did it was still over eighty bucks, and we thought it was a fair value. Look for for the next year, we don't have a ton of visibility into exactly what revenue growth and earnings per share and free cash flow will be. And given that the immediate year ahead, that that cash flow installment is always the most important. When, when you do a discounted cash flow analysis of a business, the very first cash flow projection is always the most important. We don't know exactly what that's going to look like. But here's kind of what we we plugged in. And we think these are like, you know, fairly reasonable targets for microchip to hit. Based on their outlook through 2026, they think revenue is going to grow between 10 to 15%. So far, uh, since they provided this long-term outlook in 2022, they have clobbered that expectation. So let's just say uh, revenue growth uh, equates to something along the lines of 18% uh, earnings per share or or 18% free cash flow per share growth for the next two years, and then it drops to 5% after that. Even with that pretty low bar uh, and using using a discount rate of like 11%, which I think is, is high for this particular business because they don't have a ton of capital needs, that's a fair price target of about 88 bucks per share. So we think this is a very, very fair price uh, yes, the balance sheet looks ugly, and typically that's not what we would like to see when we make a new investment in the company. We want to see more net cash in short-term investments than we see debt. At any rate, given what Microchip did to get themselves here to this point, we think it's an okay balance sheet, um, but a very well-run business, uh, a business that is enjoying some very strong secular growth trends. And that's showing up in these numbers. Uh, obviously, their operations are dialed in very well that they're able to continue growing revenue in this current environment. So that being said, we think those expectations that we set are reasonable. We think a fair a fair value on this stock right now is roughly 88 bucks. Let's talk about Lattice Semiconductor. And this company is very, very small in comparison. The In the recent quarter, they had a revenue of 184 million, uh, previous, which would be a 22% year-over-year growth, which is also huge. Uh, gross margin for this company set almost 70%, and free cash flow around 36 million. Balance sheet for the for Lattice Semiconductor is about even 112 million in cash and short-term investments and current debt sits around 116 million. We've done recent videos on Lattice and as you talked about last week, we purchased some some Lattice and added it to our portfolio. So what is unique about this company and why why are we buying this stock right now? As we alluded to last week, we we made a small nibble, a very very small initial purchase of Lattice. Basically, our strategy in this is uh, this is this is how we start like a, a dollar cost average plan into a company that we think has fantastic long term potential, multi year potential, if not a decade or more potential. But we think we may not be getting the best price possible, but we're unsure if it is ever going to dip to what we consider to be a fair price. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. Okay, good. That's kind of like the three criteria for when we like take a, a, a small starter position and plan on ramping up from here. So the reason why um, 
has less to do with the fact that we've actually been watching Lattice Semi for like almost four years now, waiting for that fair price and watching it just continue to go up and up and up. Less to do with that. More to do with the fact that basically two things here. Lattice is the last FPGA, Field Programmable Gate Array, stock left standing. Intel acquired two big FPGA companies back in the 2010s. And then, of course, the one everybody really knows about is AMD acquired Xilinx. That acquisition was finalized in February 2022. There's a couple small startup stage, very, very small private FPGA companies out there. But as far as publicly traded pure plays, FPGA pure plays, Lattice is it. It's still a very small company. Um, that alone doesn't guarantee it's going to grow at a faster rate than the rest of the market. But similar to microchip, there's new secular growth trends in play that are suddenly propelling Lattice higher or maybe sustaining the growth that they've enjoyed the last few years. So uh, maybe we should talk about what that is with, with their FPGA portfolio. These secular growth trends obviously are, as we talked about with microchip, are industrial and automotive. And we've covered this many times with all of the, the semiconductor companies. Automotive is definitely propelling some growth here. You can see in the, the highlights here of Q1, the industrial and automotive sex segment is 59%. And it has grown 55% year over year, which is huge. It's 21% quarter over quarter, but 55% year over year. That You may notice in this pie chart here, the consumer market is very, very small. It's only 5% in, a, it's only a 5% segment. And it's interesting because this company is no longer very reliant on us as, con as private consumers, right? So all of these decreases in sales that some of these semiconductor companies have been facing over this downturn, Lattice is not really experiencing that same thing. They've diversified away from that, which, as you mentioned before, is what AMD was trying to do, is trying to do with their acquisition of Xilinx, kind of shift the focus a little bit away from us as fickle consumers. Indeed, at this particular juncture, and it looks like for the next five to 10 years into the future, the growth is all going to come from industrial and automotive um, and also the data center and communications market uh, as well. Uh, those are a bit more mature markets overall for Lattice. But you mentioned uh, the two product lines at Lattice. Uh, they have this new product line called the Avant. It's, it's kind of a mid-sized FPGA that kind of breaks them into new data center markets. The CEO, James Anderson, called these greenfield opportunities for Lattice, uh, some of these new FPGA footprints that they've developed. Um, Casey also mentioned the free cash flow. It did dip a little bit, like 6% year over year dip in the quarter. Uh, a lot of that is driven because of this new product line. The company has invested to develop it uh, and is now bringing it to market this year, addressing some some new needs within the data center. Uh, but capital expenditures like this uh, can can vary from year to year. If this becomes a successful product launch, uh, the average selling prices of these larger FPGAs are actually higher than the company's traditional industrial and automotive markets. Uh, so not only are they getting the secular tailwind from industrial and automotive, but also this brand new market that they're breaking into in data centers uh, that can really fuel even more revenue growth in, in the years to come. Now, uh, I mentioned average selling prices uh, for Lattice's FPGAs. I wanted to ask you about this, Casey, because this is something that you homed in on, especially last quarter when we were taking a look at Lattice here, kind of behind the scenes in our research. And you had recently put together the industry, semiconductor industry flowchart, and we have electronic design automation, EDA software, kind of at the top of the chart because it's a critical choke point uh, from which software kind of flows back into the development of chips. 
to kind of fuel like the next generation of advanced chips. Let's talk about average selling prices and EDA software because you you pointed out this is a very, very important point three months ago uh, as potentially a big deal for Lattice Semiconductor in, in the coming years. Uh, absolutely. I think this is probably what really got me interested in Lattice Semiconductor because it, it's – their their software portfolio is growing more and more and these these the chips that they're selling these FPGAs need to be designed they need to be tailored to the use of each company right so if lattice also provides the software that helps them to do that to to design and tailor these chips to what the consumer needs it's perfect right so the ceo mentioned that over half of the new silicon design wins are enabled by at least one of their software solution stacks. So they have multiple software options for consumers to choose from that will fit their needs. But the point is, is that having this stickiness of the software working with the FPGA is 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 really huge. It makes them, it makes it makes this company really really appealing. And and appealing. I would say not just from an investment standpoint, like we're talking about, but if you're, again, an industrial or automotive customer, uh, which is not a, you're not a tech company, you probably do not have the internal know-how, not just put an FPGA out into the field, but then also, you know, reprogram it for, for ongoing needs moving forward. A company like this that makes it as easy as possible uh, to implement your solution is going to win. And I think that's that's the other key story here for Microchip as well as Lattice is they have made it very easy to make their products usable. Uh, because again, these new secular growth trends that are starting to, to fuel the chip industry are coming from non-tech businesses. So you need to make yourself a very friendly, easy to use chip chip designer and chip maker uh, if you want to capture the lion's share of this growth moving forward. How is this company doing as far as share buybacks and dividends? Well, this is not a dividend paying company. However, uh, they have made it the aim of They've made it the aim to repurchase stock now for for quite some time. Uh, you can see, again, we're, we're pulling this chart from our friends over at Main Street Data. The buyback program started the tail end of 2020. I think it took a couple of years for Lattice to kind of right itself after they hired James Anderson away from, from AMD a number of years back. But now you can see a pretty robust... Uh, stock buyback plan in place here. And I think that's that's notable because this is a very small business still. Uh, what, what was the revenue again for Q1, Casey? Yeah, their Q1 revenue was $184 million. Yeah, that's that's peanuts, right? That, that's a, this is a this is a tiny semiconductor design house when you have competitors doing billions of dollars a year in revenue and you're you still haven't hit the 1 billion per year uh revenue run rate even so the business is efficient it's profitable and they feel comfortable to return some of that profitability to shareholders via buybacks i think that's important because uh even though this has been a story of not just revenue growth but also rising profit margins over the last 4 5 years uh that story doesn't necessarily have to be over. Uh, this company can continue to scale and get more efficient as it as it becomes if if it becomes bigger in the coming years. Um, so I think that's an important point. I don't think the profit margin expansion story is finished, and I certainly don't think the cash return to shareholder program has even really begun to scratch the surface. So uh, I think it's still early days for this. I would expect to see uh, share buybacks ramp up over the next five years. Or why did we buy this stock at this time? Because uh, you you told me we needed to. No. Uh, so 
as mentioned, our three criteria for taking a starter position, we see uh, years, if not a decade or more of, of upside for this business. And if you look far enough into the future, you'll find, a, you'll find that a current stock price is a fair value. <laughs> uh, but you don't want to look too far into the future because the, the first year of cash flow in your, in your DCF and your discounted cash flow analysis is always the most important. Okay. So assuming that, uh, this, this company Lattice semiconductor is richly valued right now, still just a skosh over 80 bucks per share. Our fair value is actually more like 62, 63 bucks per share. That's assuming about 18 to 20% earnings growth for the next two years, maybe three if we're being generous. I don't want to go too far out. Uh, and then maybe 8% thereafter give, gives you that fair value estimate of about 60, let's say 60 to 65 bucks, depending on how you want to alter the numbers here. Um, I'm using old information. We're actually getting ready to listen to Lattice Semi's uh, investor day. And they're probably going to give us some financial model uh, updates. And so this fair value estimate may change. But basically, we wanted to start a dollar cost average plan into this stock. So we're going to take very small nibbles on a monthly basis for about a year and see where we're at. Yeah, I wanted to invest all of my IRA, my Roth IRA into this, but uh, you told me no. So I guess we'll, I'll settle for uh, DCA. You are sometimes a bigger risk taker than I am. And um, this is probably one of those stocks a while back where I should have just shut up and listened. At any rate, uh, that's beside the point. Lattice Semiconductor, one of Casey's favorite chip stocks. Exactly. Okay, so we have one short bonus segment for you here, and it's about the behemoth Taiwan Semiconductor and the legend Warren Buffett. Yeah, this is this is coming up because the question keeps getting asked, um, and it's probably getting asked again because Berkshire's annual shareholder event was last last weekend. I guess two weekends ago at this point. Um, yeah, we're not a breaking news show, but here we go. Anyways, uh, someone did ask the question about Berkshire Hathaway buying $4 billion plus worth of TSMC and then promptly selling most of it during the following quarter. Um, so I think, Casey, the reason why this needs to come up again is we've started wanting to talk more about not just picking stocks, not just picking quality businesses, but building a portfolio. Of course, to build a portfolio, you have to pick individual stocks, but there needs to be a process behind that that fits within like an overall picture of what you see your portfolio doing not just a reflection of you, but also a reflection of what it is you're trying to accomplish because because everyone has unique goals in life. And I think this is important because I, this confounded a lot of investors that I think try to figure out what Warren Buffett is going to buy, what he might sell out of his portfolio. Uh, and this is all really... Uh, I, in my opinion, anyways, a bunch of nonsense, right? I think the very first thing I wrote publicly and published was about Warren Buffett uh, many, many years ago. What was what was it like? Five reasons to ignore Warren Buffett? Uh, at any rate, that's beside the point. Um, if you like Warren Buffett, learn from him. Uh, take some lessons from his process, but don't try to be Warren Buffett. Uh, you're not Warren Buffett. You don't have his mind. You don't. Ha you certainly don't have his situation. 
Uh, if you're one of the richest people on the planet, please stop watching this and do something else with your time. Yes, like buying Twitter. Exactly. Uh, so at any rate, portfolio construction is important. Um, he essentially laid out three reasons why he changed his mind and promptly sold TSMC. And so I summarize those in, in three points um, that I think we all know about Warren Buffett. And I think this is all you need to know about Warren Buffett. He likes very well-managed companies with strong financials. They have enough capital intensity that there's a moat. Like you can't just simply decide you're going to disrupt TSMC unless you're willing to spend tens of billions of dollars every single year to play catch up. Check. TSMC passes that test. Number two, uh, Warren Buffett's famous quote, it's far better to buy a wonderful company at a fair price rather than a fair company at a wonderful price. It's catchy and it's very true. Uh, focusing on wonderful companies at a fair price is the way to go. And TSMC, you can make the argument right now is a wonderful company at a fair price. You could probably definitely have made that argument last summer and last autumn when Berkshire made that investment. So point number two, uh, check TSMC passes. But the third, the third reason that he talked about when answering this question was Warren Buffett loves investing in America and companies based in the United States. He just likes that kind of stability. Uh, he also likes Japan. That's a different story though. Different story for a different time. But when he's looking to buy outside of the United States, he wants there to be some stability. And I think this is the one thing that, that keeps a lot of investors on the sideline with TSMC is uh, it, it appears that China may want to retake Taiwan by force at some point in the future. So it does not pass that final check. And so he reevaluated and decided to sell TSMC. Yeah, thanks for explaining that, Nick. I think that makes a lot of sense. And it it seems to me that if you really want to follow Warren Buffett, one easy way to do that is just buying shares of Berkshire Hathaway, right? Because then you get exposure to that what that company is is doing, but not necessarily taking the risks personally. Yeah, exactly. Uh we do not specialize in Warren Buffett's brand of investing. And, and when I say diversified, I don't mean simply buying a bunch of stocks from a diff bunch of different industries, just so you can say, okay, I've got my stock from this industry. But more importantly, when we say diversification, different businesses that are going to behave differently in different situations. And so therefore will play a valuable role in a different type of market environment. Basically, when you, whenever you construct a portfolio in a perfect world, you want a different stock that is going to help drive, keep driving your portfolio forward, regardless of what the economy is doing. So uh, for us, Berkshire Hathaway kind of fits that bill. And I think that's a valuable lesson that, that, that Buffett basically uh, summarized during when answering that specific question on TSMC, um, have, have a particular checklist that works for you. And if you're strict, if you're a good investor, you should be strict when you're, when you're going through that checklist of items. And if it's a key ingredient, uh, that, that gives you a green light for buying a stock and a company doesn't meet or pass that test, walk away, find something else. Or wait until later, until that particular solution, uh, problem has, has, has been solved. Um, a good investor is going to say no far more times than they're going to say yes. And this is exactly what Buffett did. And, you know, maybe this doesn't pan out. It doesn't work. Maybe five years from now, a bunch of investors pile on and say, look at how dumb of a decision this was that they sold TSMC. But really, that doesn't matter. It didn't pass his test. And so he walked away. And that's a powerful lesson for, for all of us. 
that's a wrap for this episode, lattice semiconductor and microchip, and then our bonus round of Warren Buffett's sale of TSMC several months ago. So, and the lessons we can all learn from that. So hope you enjoyed the, the video. Please make sure you comment, like the video. Please, please, please share our channel with your social group. We could really use the support. We thank you very much for the support you've given us so far, and we hope you have a great rest of the week.